Hello, everyone. Welcome to another International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today, we speak about the new government in India after the elections. It's a new government, but it remains very much like the old one. But there are changes, there are challenges, and we need to look at them at this time when the government has just taken over. The Prime Minister is the same. The Minister of Foreign Affairs is the same. The National Security Advisor is the same. And therefore, we can imagine that the style will be more or less the same. One concern, of course, is that the ruling party, the BJP, does not have a majority on its own. And therefore, there could be occasion when, occasions when uh, there will be difficulties in uh, carrying out a mandate which is acceptable to all the coalition partners. And that is the difference and that is being seen as a positive change because the general feeling is that if one political party uh, has a very big majority, uh, then that party might tend to be a little more dictatorial than others. And therefore, there is a general sense of uh, relief, particularly in the Western countries, uh, that India is right on the democratic track uh, because the BJP needs the support of some allies to carry on its business. Uh, this could be from an international point of view, uh, positive in the sense that they will call it truly democratic, as though in a proper election, somebody gets a huge majority, then it is not democratic anymore. That's not a very good uh, conclusion. Uh, but whatever it is, the, the noises that we were hearing in the Western press about India's democracy is only half democracy, and the fear that uh, dictatorial shape and fascism are coming, etc. We have been hearing for about the last one year or so. But the same people who have been, you know, praising uh, Mr. Modi as a as a global leader, a person who gives the lead to the new changes in the international system, etc. The same people were wondering whether it was. Uh, uh, India was going in the, in a the wrong direction. So in that sense, uh, this is more comfortable for people outside and also many people inside India who, who believe that uh, in the absence of a, a proper opposition, uh, the government could, be, could not be controlled or they'll take decisions which uh, everyone may not approve of. Anyway, to that, in that sense, it's, a, it's an improvement uh, because there are other parties in it and uh, their views will have to be taken into account when major decisions are taken. So that is one point. But this coalition is slightly different from the coalition that Dr. Manmohan Singh had or Mr. Narasimha Rao had because we all always had, we all have had uh, minority governments in the past also. Uh, but in the, those coalitions, there were parties which had a different perspective on foreign policy than the main government. We remember that the whole uh, nuclear deal with the um, United States uh, was opposed by members of the coalition. Uh, the, the communist parties, for example, they had an anti-United States uh, slant and they did not approve of the negotiations that were taking place on the nuclear deal. They felt that India was surrendering too much to the United States, making too many concessions. And they even left the government when the nuclear, uh, nuclear agreement was signed. So such a situation can arise in coalitions. But if you look at the present coalition, where BJP, then Chandrabab Naidu, and Nitish Kumar, so these are people who are not very particularly 
uh, you know, different in their approach to international relations than the BJP. But they have a fairly um, fair assessment of India-US relations and India's relations in the world, etc. So this coalition may not create the kind of problems that uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh faced when there was a coalition in formulating in foreign policy. But he was courageous enough uh, to put his uh, government in the risk of uh, losing the majority and still went ahead and signed the nuclear deal. And finally, everybody was happy. Even the communists would have regretted that they left the government at a time when they were doing a good job internationally. So good and bad in the new present situation, but it is more positive from an international perspective. So uh, the, the external affairs minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, said as soon as he took over as foreign minister a second time, he did say that uh, the business will be as usual. There will be no change in India's foreign policy and uh, we will pursue our interests. And of course, he mentioned we'll take special interest in, the, in our relations with China and Pakistan. So it's a fair uh, expectation uh, that the policy will be more or less the same and uh, things will go smoothly. But one thing that we need to remember is that continuity alone is not enough. Continuity is good if we are able to go on this line that we have been taking so far and generally doing acceptable things like we did in G20. For the first time, an agreement was reached, a consensus was reached on the Russia-Ukraine war though nothing happened on the ground. Um, similar things India has been doing. The G20 was a, was a major change in multilateralism. Uh, so uh, these things had happened and uh, India's name was rising. The possibility of India becoming the third largest economy. And generally things were moving very well. But what happens in this situation is that since the old world order has ceased to exist, exist and uh, people are looking for a new global order. Everybody is in a very competitive mood because nobody knows who will really be the leader of the world or the leaders of the world in the next 10 or 15 years because everyone has one problem or the other and they have their strengths and their weaknesses and those are all being put on show as it were because each country expects that it will get a prominent position in the new order which will be emerging. Of course, the idea was we'll have uh, several uh, centers of power, not just one center of power, it will be uh, more broad, probably about six countries uh, may lead, six groups, all these things were being speculated. But in the last one year or so, the Western countries seem to believe that India is doing well, but it is doing too well. Because what they would like to do is for India to be subservient to them. Subservient to them. No one wants another country to be in the leadership uh, position. Uh, I remember Barack Obama once said, yes, we are very happy that India is developing and doing well. But we would like to retain our number one position. And this is the position of every country. Our position cannot be affected. India can do well, we will support as much as possible. And this was said to me in a very special context. When we are talking about nuclear trade, I was talking to a, a senior official in the White House as to what the prospects were of the nuclear trade now that we have signed this agreement. Uh, then he, some, he said something uh, very unusual. So he said that we did the, we signed the agreement to enable India to progress, to have trade, nuclear trade with other countries, and generally liberate you from the restraints of being not being a, a signatory to the Nuclear Non Proliferation Treaty. And therefore, now you are a responsible state and uh, you will be able to do business with people and also try and see whether. You can uh, expand your uh, nuclear energy uh, capacity. So all these we did.
But we do not want to be accused of making India a nuclear power. So we'll short, stop short of that in the sense that India can develop its requirements, etc. Uh, but if there is a possibility through this nuclear trade, India starts uh, developing technology and its strength so much that they may overtake some of the others. And that is not something they are not, they are not in favor of. So he simply said in 2007 to me that there is likely to be no nuclear trade between India and the United States. I, I was very surprised and I wrote about this and there was a bit of a commotion in the international market because many people were expecting to sign uh, nuclear contracts with India and the American position and American companies themselves are getting ready to set up nuclear reactors in India. And this particular position expressed by a senior official of the uh, White House surprised many people. And many people called me to ask uh, who the source of this uh, information was. Naturally, one doesn't talk about the sources in diplomacy. And But look at the situation today. We, have, we have, do not have any foreign uh, nuclear reactor in India. Even so, the, though this was signed in 2008, several years have passed. And uh, locations were allocated to the United States, also to uh, France, etc. But we still only have the good old um, Russian uh, reactor in Putin Krom. There is no foreign reactor. The other reactors are all ours. So it's quite evident uh, that uh, cooperation in the eyes of developed countries is only to help you out, not to make you a uh, competitor. And uh, I suspect that the uh, Western countries still do not see India as a partner, only a, more or less as a, as a rival. And that has caused some, some problems in India's relationship with the West, including the United States and Canada. So we have seen this that soon after G20, Mr. Trudeau went to his own parliament and accused us of having killed one of their citizens in their soil. And subsequently, United States came up with a case <coughs> that there has been an attempt to assassinate a, a Khalistan activist uh, by Indian authorities. Because nothing was proved, no uh, evidence was shown to us, <coughs> but several statements were made that this was unacceptable. I mean, such things have not happened in the past. We have been opposed to terrorism all our life, particularly, um, you know, after 9-11 and so on. And we have been saying that in Jammu and Kashmir, there is so much of terrorism and we need to deal with them with a firm hand. So all this was known. Uh, but uh, even about the position that we are taking about terrorism, they suspect that this is some kind of, a, of an excuse to criticize Pakistan or someone else. So India, our image is getting better. They are seeing us as a more powerful country. They see you as a partner because we are a member of many groups in which they are there. We are in a Quad at the same time. We are also in ESC, the, uh, the Eastern uh, Summit um, and uh, several, several groups which are not homogeneous. So there is a general acceptance of us, but this campaign in the last one year that uh, uh, you know Indian democracy is not going to last, uh, somebody is likely to change the constitution, and uh, such some such, and that had an influence on the Indians on the ground. So perhaps the difference in the votes that BJP got may have been caused by uh, this kind of propaganda. Uh, by Westerners. Of course, some of these writings in the Western journals were written by Indians, we know that. Um, but still, there are some kind of, a, of a, what shall we say, a, a, a kind of concern uh, that uh, India was going out of their control or out of their reach, etc. Et and uh, so I think this is something. So if, you, if we say we have just continuity and we'll go on like what we are doing, uh, may not be enough in the new situation. So I'm sure the new government is fully aware of that. 
And uh, one of the first things that uh, our government will have to do, our minister will have to do, and all of us and the embassies and everywhere has to do, is to first of all uh, remove these fears that there is something dreadful is going to happen to you. And uh, that we have to be very clear, we have to speak about our constitution, our uh, judiciary, our media, all of them uh, are pro-democratic and our constitution is absolutely uh, strong and nobody can change the constitution like that. There are many safeguards. All these we need to continue to uh, put forward because this anxiety is remote. Whether it's possible or not, I don't know. But uh, uh, with, with this new uh, government, uh, since it is a pluralist government which everybody wanted, uh, we should certainly try and remove these uh, suspicions, uh, particularly countries like the United States. Now, uh, we had a fairly good relationship with the uh, United States during the Trump administration. But it is after the Democrats came to power that questions were being raised about Indian democracy. And that's been continuing. Mr. Biden had a certain uh, you know, fascination for Pakistan. He was given a big award by the Pakistan government and so on. And he dealt with them for many years. So he has a soft corner with Pakistan. Therefore, he was not very willing to uh, accept many of the accusations that you're making. And he had a bad experience with Taliban. So he was wondering how to retrieve that image, etc. And um, so in the process, uh, relations with the United States, particularly after this accusation about, uh, uh, you know, Khalistani terrorists and how India is dealing with them. And so this has to be dealt with. And uh, in several ways, it can be done. And that, I think, one of the preoccupations of the of the new government. Of course, in India itself, foreign policy was not an issue during these elections. The border, the border was fairly calm, but still the foreign minister said that one of the priorities will be to deal with China and Pakistan. Uh, this is quite clear because Pakistan has considerable uh, instability. Uh, we do not know how long the present prime minister will last, whether Nawaz Sharif will come back or Rami will have an upper hand, all these are possible. But whatever may happen, Pakistan will not have stability because they are economically weak and uh, they do not have, the, the army is not as powerful as before to control the politicians. And therefore, things can go wrong in time. And uh, therefore, Pakistan is a, is a constant worry for us. And China has been a worry, but now it is the most worrisome. Because China's policies towards India have been deteriorating. Uh, for example, after Ladakh, whatever conversations we had, um, the Chinese bluntly told us that all these agreements which have signed in 1988 and you know later um, during Narasimha Rao's message, you know, visit and all that. Uh, they are saying that these are not valid, as though there is no basis for the relationship between India and China. This, uh, the Tranquility Agreement, all these they have disowned. So, China is on the war path with us, and that's very clear. They have not moved out of the areas they occupied in Ladakh, and uh, they are, of course, tightening its uh, claim over Arunachal Pradesh. You know, Arunachal Pradesh, when the Indian Prime Minister goes to Arunachal Pradesh, they protest. And um, uh, and they have started naming, you know, cities in Arunachal Pradesh with Chinese names, you know, indicating that this is their land, and any day they are willing to uh, fight to take it back. So in this situation, it is not easy for us to deal with China. It's very clear. They are very powerful. They have influence all around the world. Their economy is much larger than ours. Their army is much larger than ours. So a fair battle with China or a war with China is not possible. But we have said various things we have devised. We, we have always been willing to talk, number one. Secondly, we are trying to reduce our uh, economic dependence on India by way of trade. We are strengthening our defense capability. We are building facilities on the border. 
and also we are cultivating good friends abroad so these are the factors that we are using in order to counter the chinese issue but all this does not seem to have much impact on that and uh, with their uh, keen interest in uh, in uh, taking back taiwan which they keep repeating and also showing their fist and uh, power against taiwan most recently in their exercises etc so there is always a danger of china becoming more active in the east china so china sea and also in uh, that region and if god forbid something should happen in uh, taiwan that would be a global war nothing less and so in this context how much can we improve our relations with china we really have no conversation with them and they keep saying that they want to be friendly relations with us but they are not showing any interest so pakistan remains as the as the old uh, rival or enemy to india and china is a new one much stronger and much more dangerous so it's quite clear that uh, continuity is not enough in the case of uh, pakistan and china and uh, we will have uh, uh, more problems in the future uh, then of course uh, the two war situations suppose so according to some calculations there are uh, uh, 10 wars raging in the world starting from russia ukraine palestine uh, to uh, haiti sudan mention a kind name there is some kind of ethiopia there are many wars taking place at least lack of peace i think exists in these places and why is it that uh, nothing seems to be ending here so this is a very peculiar situation about the 21st century it looks because all the wars and conflicts in the 20th century had a, an end in sight right from the beginning many of the wars were not justified but even when they occurred it was possible to deal with it and that's what we expected when russia moved into ukraine and we thought that this will last 3 days or 4 days or 5 days and um, it will be over and and the russians will realize their objectives whatever they were and uh, ukraine will not be able to uh, put up a big fight so there doesn't seem to be any possibility of a ceasefire both sides do not want a ceasefire that's not the situation normally because it's intolerable situation and then somebody will want to stop the war somehow and the others will be able to help in the, similarly in the case of palestine it has started as a hamas attack yes um, but uh, this is proportionate use of force to Uh, extinguish Palestinians altogether, or at least get them out of Gaza and send them onto the uh, onto the West Bank. All this is much disproportionate to what the Hamas did. Of course, what the Hamas did was wrong; it was a terrorist attack. Uh, but why why Hamas did that? We have a certain guess that it is uh, basically to revive the Palestinian issue. because recently the agreements between arab countries and Pal- israel have been increasing even saudi arabia was on the pay- point of signing an agreement together with the uh, united states and israel so all these were indications that palestine cause is no is gone in none of these statements even at g20 there was no reference to uh, palestine's right to a state two parties two states <coughs> formula etc were not to be seen anywhere so hamas may have thought that this is their last chance before saudi arabia signs an agreement a uh, hit even if we have to sacrifice ourselves and thus revive palestine and so it got revived and uh, they actually you know their uh, objective was met in the sense that palestine has come to the forefront and uh, they have somebody like iran who is willing to battle for palestine they even when they attacked israel fortunately there it didn't uh, become a major war so the palestinian issue is not dead anymore that was their objective but in the process the children and women and men innocent men being you know uh, massacred every day the numbers going up and there is no retreat even uh, areas where the refugees were rafa where the refugees were taking shelter even there there was attack 
in spite of all the world, countries of the world, including United States, asking uh, uh, Netanyahu to retreat. So, like all these other uh, problems of the 21st century seem to be festering. Like, of course, the 9-11, uh, uh, it has not been resolved, terrorism is still there. The economic problems of 2007-2008 uh, still have their implications. That the pandemic is still around somewhere or the, or the other. Uh, and so, none of these seems to be ending. And is this a new feature of the 21st century? We do not know. So, here again, is there something that the new government of India can do? I'm sure they must be thinking about it, whether there is any solution possible. But apart from the consensus in New Delhi between Russia and NATO as part of that uh, agreement, uh, there was nothing. We could not contribute to anything because they were not. Neither of the parties was willing to come to terms or go to the negotiating table. So, will we be able to uh, contribute anything to peace in this context? And that is something that we have to look at. And um, we ourselves don't mediate naturally, generally. Um, and also there is no scope for it at this moment. Uh, but the new government will have to focus on this because we have been, our, our relationship with Israel has been improving. And now it could all be, all be a standstill because they don't have even weapons to fight. And how will they export weapons to India? So such problems may come. Uh, Russia's oil situation may change. So, so what I mean to say is continuity alone is not going to help us in this process because we need to work harder in, on uh, some of these issues and make sure that our interests are uh, uh, protected and also make sure that the Western countries particularly will look at us as partners rather than as, as rivals. Um, but um, uh, the main main question will be, whatever we do, will be the kind of global order that may emerge. As of now, we have a very big problem uh, because our best friend and our worst enemy have got together. Russia and China. Of course, there was an agreement before the Ukraine war started. Um, and it was a limitless agreement, etc. Uh, but of, after that, the visit to Beijing, Beijing of uh, President Putin has led to even much bigger uh, embrace between them. So we are depending on good relations with Russia. And it is pleasing to hear Russia saying nice things about us and also cooperating in the oil deals, etc., etc. And there is no uh, uh, you know, gap in our relationship. It has remained mainly because their preoccupation has changed and they may not have the missiles, etc., to supply to us because of their own, their own needs. So in this situation of China and Russia working together, where do we go? And uh, if we go to the United States, who will be the president? So the question will arise. Everybody says that Mr. Uh, Trump will, lo will win, or, but uh, he has lost the case in, uh, in the court. What will the implications it will have on his candidature? And even if he's a candidate, will he be able to uh, uh, come to power? And if he comes to power, what will he be at his agenda? Because there's nothing predictable with Mr. Trump. He tried to, tried to go and embrace North Korea and create a trouble with North Korea even more. And um, so he has this uh, uh, bee in his bonnet about his not being a warmonger. He never started any war while every other president seems to have done so. And um, so what will he do? Will he go and immediately go to China and... Uh, you know, make friendship with them like he did with uh, Moscow. So, what is he going to do? And what is his going to attitude towards India? Because the comforting thought is Modi and uh, Trump are 
have been good friends, but I don't think they have been in touch for some time because Modi is not in, I'm sorry, the, uh, Trump is not in power. Um, so this will be another major obstacle or a challenge that India has to face in its uh, uh, third uh, incarnation. Uh, and so we need to uh, find a way in which uh, they do not work together against India's interests. And uh, we are able to keep them apart. But of course, their own national interests will dictate differently. And so we cannot expect uh, that anything will be done immediately. And all this China is doing in the context of Taiwan, because if they are going to act in Taiwan, uh, China, be Russia becomes very crucial. And uh, the fact that during the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, they did not, uh, you know, China did not uh, attack Russia or criticize Russia, or they tried to bring about some kind of a resolution of the issue. All this is very much there. And therefore, it will be a hard task for us. It's not going to be easy for India to, in the, in the third term, uh, to be uh, to manage international affairs in a in a proper manner. Uh, there was also another recent development in which uh, China spoke about uh, the cooperation, the corridor, the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which is part of the BRI. It's a very strong one. They are doing a lot of things in the occupied Kashmir. So here, the issue is that this, uh, the third uh, government of uh, Mr. Modi has been talking about uh, recovering the Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And earlier it was a wish, we hope it happens, etc. But now, these days, it has become stronger. That India seems to be demanding uh, that uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir should be vacated, otherwise we will take action in whatever way we can. And uh, that is another setback and a challenge that we have to face. How do we deal with uh, POK, Pakistan occupied Kashmir? Because we have been shouting from the top of the, wor of the world that uh, India, the, the LOC is acceptable. Uh, we have never said that uh, POK should also be part of India. Though the parliament resolution about Jammu and Kashmir says that the whole of Kashmir, that is including uh, POK and the Northern Territories will be uh, part of India. That was more of a form rather than substance. But now it appears it is different. And China has spoken about it. China has said that uh, this region is very vital for us and we have to maintain this corridor. In other words, giving a warning to India that if you play around in Nazad Kashmir, you will have to confront us. And that's another issue. So we need to look at the Azad Kashmir policy and see whether we can uh, do something which will uh, cause considerable concern to the world. Because the world is likely to ask us as to what happened because we had said that LOC should be <coughs> converted into an international uh, border. So so when you look at the world as a whole, uh, it is not a very comfortable world that we can think of. Of course, there is nothing which immediately affects our security or affects our sovereignty. But the way the world is going, it is not going in a direction that we had anticipated, that there would be six poles in the world. You know, of course, you know, US will be one pole, you know, European Union will be one. China will be one, Japan will be one, and India will be one. That was the kind of world uh, that we had envisaged. But that is not the way in which it is going. It's going in a different direction. And uh, therefore, will we be one of the poles? Or what is it that uh, we can get from the new, new world order? And that's also something that should be of uh, uh, great concern to great concern to us. So. Uh, but eventually now, at the moment, if you look at the, at the world and the way it is going, it looks as though the world will be divided <coughs> between democracies and uh, dictatorships. And if that is the kind of world that we are going to get, then we have no choice except to be the democracies. So 
our choice of uh, following a non-aligned policy may be threatened by a situation of that kind. And that also we have to worry. And so, so what I meant to tell you in this context was that though the, the continuity is there and it's good for us, uh, but there are several obstacles and difficulties in the world today. The Prime Minister is at the moment in, uh, with the G7. I don't know what they are going to discuss. India is not still a member of the APEC, which is the you know, uh, Pacific Economic Pact. We are not we are not being invited as yet. Are the G7 and the others are going to do that? And what else are they going to do in order to make sure that there is a multipolar world, not a bipolar world or a unipolar world? So these concerns are all there. And um, even with the continuity of the Ramatis Pesani, the Prime Minister, Foreign Minister and the National Security Advisor, I think they will be going back to the drawing board, as it were. But to first look at the, uh, the Western attitude towards India, whether it can be, uh, can be reduced, whether our relations with China and Pakistan can be improved, whether we can drive the world in a direction which we want as a multipolar world. So all these things must be of concern to our government at the moment. If it is not, it is high time that we did. Thank you very much. Uh, that's exactly what I talked about. As a diplomat for uh, 37 years, I cannot imagine India taking this position at this stage. Because I personally assured every diplomat that I met <laughs> that uh, we'll be quite happy with uh, uh, LOC as a border, privately and publicly. And the government also is committed to that. So to change that at this stage, even in terms of thinking of uh, any action, I think will be unrealistic. Well, I started off with uh, in Japan, and I went to Bhutan, up there to the Soviet Union, not Russia, the good old Soviet Union. Um, from there, I went to the United States three times. Then I went to Fiji as ambassador. Then I went to Kenya. Then I went, went to Washington as Deputy Chief of Mission with Ambassador Real Rank. And then finally, I retired from Vienna, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency headquarters. So these are the kind of postings I have done. Basically multilateral, because I did several multilateral postings in Vienna, in Geneva, in New York, in Nairobi, and also head of the United Nations Division in the Ministry of External Affairs. So basically, I'm a multilateralist dealing with uh, uh, the United Nations and others. This I don't know what they are planning to do. What, they, what the Pakistanis have done is to integrate POK entirely into Pakistan. But at the same time, discriminate against the people in uh, POK. So this is contradictory. If we are integrating it with Pakistan, then how can they discriminate? They have to pay more taxes, they have to pay more for electricity, they don't get the concessions that the Pakistani citizens get. So it is absolutely unrealistic or un irrational for them to do that. So I don't know what their intentions are, but certainly they will fight very hard if India raises this issue. And the first uh, fire shot has been fired by joining up with China to declare that the corridor is extremely important for them. No, 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 that's not, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that there will be always criticism against India. You know, I've dealt with multilateral human rights. There will be hundreds of reports against us, uh, rankings going low, etc., etc. But there was always some limit to that. You know, it was an honest man's uh, view. But uh, now it's gone beyond all that because uh, uh, they are saying absolute lies about India. So people sitting and reading a uh, uh, newspaper, or New York Times and Washington Post, will think that we are all in chains in India. That's the kind of impression that they convey. And they themselves know it is not so. So, uh, so they had an interest in changing the, bringing some change in the 
government of India, and they succeeded to, to a certain extent. And uh, suppose uh, Mr. Modi had no majority at all, then there would have been a big difference for India. India's progress, India's strength, which has increased in the last 10 years, etc., that would have been. Of course, not that we will not be able to manage it, but there would have been an interruption which may not have been very good for us. Well, uh, we had, in a sense, said at the time of the war that Pandit Nehru was not very keen to, uh, you know, ask for the return of XIJ because uh, Tibet had gone and become a Pakistan, become part of China, and then XIJ could not be. Uh, separated from there. And it's the same game that the Chinese are doing by calling um, Arunachal Pradesh uh, a part of Tibet. So, this annexing each other's territory, etc., is not uh, practical. But this kind of claims will be made all the time. So, well, it's up to you. In the exam, you express your opinion, not mine. And for that, you need to read more other people's opinions. Uh, you must uh, read The Wire, for example, uh, which is an opposition, uh, you know, Congress plus other of the, the kind of India Alliance position they put out. There are others. There are several uh, uh, things express, being express, expressed. And uh, examination, you don't have to express... Uh, a, a view which is supportive of the government necessarily. So you can, as long as your argument is good and it is uh, well-founded, even if you say things against the government, it will not do you any harm. But if you do that weak in a weak manner and uh, they will find that this is simply a, a poster that you are doing, then you might lose marks. So that is the, that is the different difference. Yes, Nepal is a difficult uh, situation because even in the happy days when we had good relations, the king was there and all that, still Nepal always dreamt of being independent of both India and China. And uh, that is difficult because you have a treaty relationship with India. Their existence depends on India's good relations. We even supply oil and other things across the border. So it is like being married to us, as it were. Then they cannot say we have to be, you know, uh, to uh, we, ha we have to flirt with others, and that will not be acceptable. So Nepal has to make its choice. If it wants India's support, they have to be uh, supportive of us. We have, an we have an open border with Nepal, so we cannot allow Chinese forces to uh, act there. So in that sense, uh, Nepal has to be controlled, and um, it is in their interest more than in our interest, because they cannot do the things that uh, we, they would do with us with China. You have to go the, all over the Himalayas uh, to export your products abroad. And that's not a very practical thing to do. And India has been very generous with Nepal in various ways. And so it's a matter of, uh, of a government which is conscious of these advantages and making use of them. Here again, there is no possibility of a, of a conflict. Well, I don't know much about the petrodollar system, but I can say that any change in the system will naturally affect everybody of us. In fact, this time during the war, we were saved because of our Russian oil. And so we are not affected by too much. But it, we can, it can affect us more if there is a new system. But since I don't know what that system is, I cannot predict uh, what will be. Yes, it's very serious. If they, want to do that, uh, unless you are talking about removing the Pakistani occupation <laughs> of POK. Uh, but there is no Indian occupation of POK. But, uh, so if they are willing to work with us to liberate POK, that will be good for us. Well, if any part of India is more friendly towards China, it will be harmful to us. And that is why Narasimha Rao started this whole uh, project of look east policy. So it is not looking east further into Southeast Asia, etc., but also looking at our own Northeast to see how friendly are they, are we helping them, is there no discrimination against them. So the, 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 they have to be fully integrated. 
And the Chinese say that they are not supporting Amitabh, the Amitabh, etc., as they used to do earlier. And uh, probably if we take up welfare, welfare mission, uh, you know, a lot of thing, money is being pumped and trying to make uh, people comfortable and happy. But there was a negative trend in Manipur recently. So this thing's gone. We try to uh, make them feel comfortable because you remember but there was just a rumor that something was going to happen. And all the northeastern people in Bangalore left in one night, you know, for fear of uh, some kind of attack. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, what shall we say, sort of fluid situation. And uh, the only thing we can do is to give attention to their development, go out of our way to not to discriminate against them, give, up, give them possibilities of working and doing things in the rest of India on this. So that's a continuing process. Yes, Maldives, of course, has been acting very erratically. I, you know, Maldives cannot last for one day if, we have, if they have uh, India's anger. In fact, we have maintained them, sustained them all these years. Uh, once Maldives was to be overtaken by terrorists, and we sent our troops in order to save Maldives. It's all part of history. And uh, our, our placing our soldiers or aircraft there was on the request of the Maldives government. And therefore, at the request of the, the Maldives government, we have withdrawn that. But do they realize what they are doing? Will the Chinese replace us in that? Because Chinese does not believe, Chinese do not believe in you know, humanitarian support to countries. They will have a hard war game and try to get what they can out of Maldives. And so he has fallen into this trap, Mr. Moise. Uh, but at the same time, he slowly tried to make up with India. He, he came to India for the swearing-in ceremony. And uh, he has been making some noises that China is not our only friend and we'll deal with others also. So, how important is Maldives to India geopolitically? Yes, of course, it is like a uh, like a, what, what shall we say, uh, an aircraft carrier, a land lying there, uh, which will be very good for our defense if it becomes necessary. So it is vital, Sri Lanka, Maldives, all these are very vital for India's uh, security. So we will not allow them to go beyond a point. And uh, we are being very patient and very uh, helpful. And uh, even in statements, we do not try to hurt them or threaten them. So this is all nice and therefore hopefully, uh, you know, Maldives uh, president will understand these things and will not go the way he is trying to go. So his coming to India was a good gesture. I mean, gesture in the sense he is showing that uh, he is not enemical to India, which is a good thing. So on the whole, the situation, the, from all these questions also, what emerges is that it is not a, just a uh, you know, a free walk for India in the next five years. We'll have to work very hard and, and very uh, sincerely to change the attitude of Indian nations to us. Of course, attitudes are determined by them. Uh, but it is possible for us to have a foreign policy which will not irritate them in any manner and will actually encourage them to work with us. Of course, without forgetting that uh, anti-terrorism and things like that, we cannot make any, any compromise. And that should be a factor. So when they talk about India dealing with uh, Khalistani terrorists, they should think twice that it is in their own interest to, you know, to promote terrorism in any part of the world. They themselves have been hurt in the past and will be hurt even more if terrorism goes on like this. So a, co a cooperative relationship is what we need to develop in the next five years, and we have the capability to do that. These are not related. Permanent sit in the UN will not come to us because the five, not only the five permanent members, but the majority of the General Assembly do not want it. Because um, they would rather have the present permanent members thrown out of the Security Council rather than bring new permanent members. That is a reality that we must face. No other country seriously wants India to be a permanent member except ourselves. Similarly, Japan, Germany, Brazil, South Africa, etc. Also do not have that kind of support that they can walk in. 
because basically the permanent members and the majority of the smaller countries of the world do not want new permanent members so it may be a rational thing to do that because uh, you know the world is dealing with more and more problems of the developing world so the developing world should be represented uh, but that's not how the developed world looks at it they have got this in 1945 and they'll continue with it and so that is not uh, a possibility uh, but uh, we can certainly improve our image and be more uh, forceful well that is probably was their interest that uh, to prevent anything happening in india with the constitution so they are making these allegations <clears throat> they are putting us in the defensive but the prime minister was never on the defensive about this matter us he was very straight forward about india's interest and he has been uh, uh, because he had a very strong government as a powerful leader he was doing everything possible to uh, you know press india's case uh, not only for good relations with other countries but also for a permanent seat in the world but i do not expect that to happen we may do very many other things but the permanent seat state will be the very last that we can get and how will the brics work as the second axis again against the un no not brics cannot it's only 11 countries now and uh, it's not a it is no no axis against the un what what brics will try to do under the chinese leadership they will try to change the economic system the world bank that the imf etc that is their aim and they are trying to expand brics with the supporters of china in order to find this economic battle against the world bank and the imf now we are also interested in that we are not particularly happy with the way the world bank and i know but but then for practical reasons we are cooperating with them. and china is somewhat uh, trying to undermine it but we don't see any possibility of ourselves doing it with brics or anybody else okay any more i'm very happy that there are several questions today and you're all taking a lot of interest and many of you might be preparing for the mains examination very soon so it's good for you to follow these things very closely any suggestions for ifs aspirants well as you know the examination is the same whether it is for the ias ips or ifs so there is no special suggestions for the ifs aspirants you have to take the competitive examination and pass it there is no way out and you don't need to learn foreign languages you need not learn uh, politics or history beyond a point if there is a separate foreign service examination that will happen but now the examination that you are taking is a general examination and they train you after you are okay, recruited they give you language training they give you postings according to your desire to a certain extent they make you feel comfortable allowances are become huge housing has improved a lot concessions for children's education has increased so today the foreign service is much better than the foreign service that we went through but even at that time we were well off uh, if in the foreign service you could make a modest uh, you know savings even without being dishonest and uh, because foreign allowances and uh, entertainment allowances are so many things which will support you and uh, therefore in an honest way you can have more savings in the foreign service than in the other services but in the other services it's not always the honest way i'm not saying we are always honest but uh, the point is the, op- the opportunities are less shall we say and therefore foreign service has not got into the kind of trouble that several ias officers have got into but that's a matter of integrity and honesty on your part nothing else opportunity will come anyway you like i look in the bureaucracy in india but the important thing is for you to be honest and have integrity but uh, when you are preparing for the exam just prepare for the exam as a whole whether you are taking foreign service or or not will depend on the rank you get so try to get the highest rank in the service in the examination so that you get your choice whether it is home state or whether it is foreign service or ias some people even prefer irs these days or ips so 
Uh, so if you have to get what you want, then you have to do the exam very well. Don't worry about foreign language or uh, international relations. You will learn all that by yourself. So that is my advice. But today we have a harvest of questions. I'm very happy that you're all thinking about these things. Okay, but then our time is up now. Shall we conclude? Okay.